I mean, there's a lot of sulfur <laughs> on Venus, so you might have a bit of a smelly air. <laughs> You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast. Woo! Woo! And today, it's a very special episode. It's the Q&A episode. But first, for the introductions, I know when you're sleeping, Ricky Bahir. <laughs> he knows when you're awake. Tom Harvey. Hello. She knows when you've been good or bad. Marissa Lowe. So be good for Dr. John Pernet Fisher. Well, hello there. Sake. And a very merry Christmas. I hope you all are having a lovely holiday season. Are you all full of turkey? N- Is that no. directed at us? Or... I mean, it's, we're recording this ahead of time. Well so no. ahead of time. No. Yeah. John, three yeah. of us are vegetarian. Ah, oh That's yeah. That's not a very good uh, joke Not roast us. then? Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, don't like it. I don't mind not roast, actually. Um, fine. So today we're going to be answering the questions that you lovely people gave us. Yes, indeed. Thank you all very much for your contributions. It's a good haul of questions. A bit like Santa's sack. It's bulging full of questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we better just get on with the first question, shall we? So, uh, okay. The first question uh, is from uh, Amaya. And she asks, how many stars are there in space? A lot. A lot, yeah. Well, according to ESA, there's about a trillion stars in our galaxy. A trillion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then this estimate is a bit more of an estimate about a trillion galaxies in the universe. So if you times those two numbers together, you get about a septillion, which is a one and then 24 zeros. Oh, wow. That's a lot of zeros. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just... Uh, <laughs> Flash this. <laughs> it's a lot to imagine. That's a septillion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, a lot, lot of zeros. It's a lot it's of zeros. A lot of zeros. Um, I mean, it's almost sort of unimaginable, isn't it, really? It's those, those numbers of that size. It's You can't get your head around that, can you? You can't. You can't. I mean, Is that what? based off observations from like Kepler's telescope and things like that then? or? Yeah, um, I, I think the Hubble Space Telescope Hubble's, mostly. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. And how yeah. many double-decker buses is that? <laughs> Give me a give me a month 12, to work that 12. out. Yeah, but it is it is a crazy number because you think about it. People are often thinking about whether there is life elsewhere in the universe. Well, quite. Yeah, and exactly. Each of those stars likely has planets around them yeah. or some kind of planetary body around them, and then some of those, even if it's one percent of those, exactly, is still a lot. A rocky planet that is yeah. similar to the Earth. It's a ridiculous amount. Yeah, so exactly. So life. Probable. Elsewhere in the universe, probable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And what's that equation? It's got an equation, isn't it? The Drake. Drake yeah. equation, there we go. So, yeah, very thank good. you. Yes, good question. Yeah. Thank you very much. So next, just load it up here. Ah, well, the next question is from Matthew Harvey. And okay. Matthew asks, what's the most interesting tool or approach uh, to cross over from another discipline into the study of meteorites? Which is a really good question. Mm. So we were chatting a bit about this um, beforehand, weren't we? Sort of brainstorming some of these answers. And so you were talking a bit about, Tom, about um, some of the satellite industry and sort of the engineering that goes along with all the remote sensing data sets. Yeah, well, obviously, studying meteorites is a very kind of fine detail approach Mm. because it often involves getting absolutely everything out of really Mm. tiny samples. And that's obviously because of the limited amount of samples that are available. Yes, yeah, exactly. You're going to get as much out of it as you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, so in that respect, all the mass spectrometry that requires, you know, good physics, good chemistry. So actually working with the tools themselves, I guess, yeah, is, is obviously a big step of a point. Uh, but from the satellite images point of view, so obviously that's not directly looking at meteorites, but it's looking at the potential sources of the meteorites from mm. their planetary bodies themselves. Yeah. So I think we were saying things such as the, the spectrometers on board of uh, satellites are a big one so i don't know what the one for the for the moon is there's a yeah the well M-cubed. we mentioned this uh, a few weeks ago didn't we uh, m cubed the moon mineralogy mapper yeah. which maps mm. in the infrared mm-hmm. and it looks at the um the different minerals and the rocks will reflect the infrared or absorb the infrared mm-hmm. differently and you can have a handle on lithology mm-hmm. so and actually it works really well for the moon since there's um not a lot of surface like dust or rust or whatever like there is on mars mm-hmm. you actually get a quite a good 
uh, geological map as a function of doing this. And so it's actually quite good for pairing meteorites mm -hmm. to where they likely came from on the moon. Whereas oh, for Mars, okay. it's yeah, a Because I was going to say, surely there is, it's covered in regolith, but obviously there's nothing that moves the regolith about no, as much and it, as on Mars. No, and the regolith is still yeah. just broken down bedrock anyway. Oh, yeah, exactly. So the you can still look surface. at general chemical trends. And you, mm -hmm. don't, you don't get like precise pinpoint areas. Mm -hmm. you, it's more like... I don't know, a dozen or half a dozen different locations. I have a feeling, actually, we touched on this last Q&A. I don't remember now. Uh, um, we but, but then there's the, there's the CRISM data set yes, as well yeah. for Mars, which is a lot more difficult to then pinpoint mm. Martian rocks to where they came from. So, like, for instance, uh, as you said, with Mars, there is this all this dust everywhere, like with the moon. But and but sediments, it, too, I guess. Yes, all the clays yeah, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but that, a lot of that stuff has been moved around on Mars. So you might have yeah. a load of dust oh, yeah. on the yeah. surface, which isn't from its original source. So I know with Mars Curiosity, for instance, they were using CRISM to try and identify areas with clays, and then Mars Curiosity would go there and find there's not nearly as much clay as that was identified in the images, or there wasn't any at all in some cases. So it's a, it's a lot more difficult when it comes to Mars using that spectrometry data, but you need to start somewhere, yeah. and it's a good start. It is a good point. start. Yeah. I think it's especially interesting because as the two fields have kind of developed, you've got sample science and remote sensing. Yeah. They're very complementary. Oh, in absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. The sample science informs you know, the kind of compositions that the, the satellites are looking for, mm -hmm. and then that kind of larger regional information gives us you know more information to feed back into our understanding of where the samples came from yeah. in the first place well yeah absolutely and it's really important to get that um, actual physical sample knowledge as well because mm -hmm. it's almost like a ground truth isn't it mm -hmm. i mean you know a lot of these teams that uh, operate spectrometers on in orbit around places they often have you know geologists and mm -hmm. sample people there to tell them you know is this realistic do you expect to find this combination of minerals mm -hmm. in this particular site because they don't know necessarily I mean, that probably is one of the best things and probably one of our favourite things about planetary science is that it is such a multidisciplinary yeah, mix absolutely. of engineering, physics, yeah. chemistry, geology. Absolutely. I mean, we've said this before, like planetary sciences and geology in general is it's the application of all these different fundamental yeah. sciences, isn't mm. it? Which is mm. um, quite cool, I guess. So, yeah, very good question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So next... Uh, we have a question from Anne, and she asks, <laughs> what is the lifespan of the Earth's core? Will it stop burning at some point, mm. and what will happen to the planet? Which is a really good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this, this is the idea, then, that the uh, the Earth has a, a molten inner core, mm -hmm. and ultimately that's what's driving our magnetic field, isn't mm -hmm. it? So, from what I understand, it's got a while until it solidifies. It's cooling very slowly. So it's, we've still got a few more billion years mm -hmm. left on it. Mm -hmm. And then what will happen? Well, it'll be probably quite difficult for life to survive with no magnetic field. Yeah, so some people ask the question of um, what will happen to the solar system when the sun starts to expand and it gets to the end of all of its fuel? But normally the answer in response to that is it won't matter. Our core will have solidified by then anyway. Yeah, well, so quite. we'll have bigger problems. Well, quite. Yeah, yeah, so. So, but I guess this is a really relevant question for understanding what's happened to Mars, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because people think that Mars... Essentially, its is solid, is core is solidified. solidified yeah. Because Which Mars... Is... A, it's an odd one with Mars because Mars' uh, core will have solidified potentially around about... 3.6 billion years ago so that means it only really had a active core for around a billion and a bit but it's a much smaller planet yes it is a much yeah. smaller planet but yes, but this yeah. is in a period when it there was water there was yeah, an atmosphere, atmosphere yeah so, and, the, so we think there was a magnetic field at that yes point. so the re, the evidence we base the idea that had magnetic field off is that well, for instance, it had water and an active water cycle and atmosphere during that period. But also when we look at rocks of different ages from the different rovers, we find that some of them had a magnetic field during about 3.7 billion years ago. And then when we look at rocks that are 3.5 billion years, they no longer have a magnetic field. So it seems to imply that at some point it lost it's magnetic field. And then I guess really coming down to the nub of the question then is why is a magnetic field so important mm -hmm. to, to sustaining life? Mm -hmm. And I guess this comes down to this idea that really um, it's the magnetic field that's protecting us from all the deadly radiation, yeah. from galactic radiation, gamma radiation that's just um, background and solar radiation as well. That the loving ultimately sun that wants to kill us. To, yeah, absolutely. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it strips away the atmosphere. Is That's yeah. why mm. Mars has lost its atmosphere. Cause exactly. It's just been eroded over time mm -hmm. and lost to space. And obviously yeah. without an atmosphere, you can't breathe. <laughs> Can you not? It's very true. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's even a question of debate now, whether right. it is 
purely down to the sun because Venus doesn't have a magnetic field, but it has Does one it of not? the That's thickest point, atmospheres actually. in the solar system. Yeah. That's so there's point. a load of questions that are still up in the air. And for instance, there's still a- uh, evidence of active volcanism on Mars up until fairly recently. And when I say mm. fairly recently, I'm talking millions of years. Why don't people think uh, Mars has uh, an active... Sorry, Venus has an active core or a, a non-solidified core because it's a similar size to this planet. Yeah, yeah I, d- I don't know. Well, it doesn't have a magnetic field. That's, that's why. Okay. So if we're playing by Earth's rules, I yeah. guess we would assume it doesn't have a magnetic mm, field, yeah. but... Interesting. Maybe there's something different going on there. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah. A lot of questions that need answers. Well, Venus, we know a, a trivial amount about, really, yeah, anyway, don't yeah. we? Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so our next question comes from Sam. And Sam asks, how many meteorites have been found? Which is a really good question, actually. Mm. And the answer is a hell of a lot. So I think we were just doing some Googling earlier, weren't we? Yeah, we... I think between 40,000 and 50,000 have been found. Yeah, I mean, I was aware. Yeah, it's, it's a lot, isn't it, actually? And you don't necessarily think that it's going to be that many. But they're all mostly what are called ordinary chondrites. And so is that all just ones that have been archived? Or is that based on there may be even more than that, but people just haven't handed them in? They just have them. Oh, in private collections, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't probably be that many because the bulk of what's collected are through, yeah. you know, uh, the Antarctic yes, surveys yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Either way, it's a hell of a lot of material. Yeah. You know, if you think of all this material that's been hitting the earth over, you know, billions of years, mm-hmm. ultimately, it's a lot of material. But as I said, it, it's all ordinary chondrites, yep. these, these initial building blocks of planets. So there's actually not that much that's very interesting and Roma a few weeks ago on, on this podcast was talking to us about this wasn't he they're all mostly ordinary chondrites mm-hmm. in terms of the what I think are the interesting meteorites your lunars and your Martians there are a lot fewer and a lot rarer so this this actually actually puts into context quite nicely why Martian and lunar meteorites are so sought after because um, so as of a few months ago uh, there was uh, only sorry this is as of January 2019 there was uh, 200 and 24 classified Martian meteorites oh, wow. um, and about 370-odd lunar meteorites. Oh. So, you know, as a percentage of 50,000, that's mm. a minuscule amount. And it mm. tells you, you know, why they command such formidable prices on eBay. Um, <laughs> and, um, but it's surprising that there's only so many more m- lunar ones than Mars. I would expect a huge amount more lunar ones just because of um, geographically their location. But. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's all about... But, but yeah, but also it's a biased collection as yeah. well, isn't it? Cause we yeah, because really if you know pick up what... a lunar one, you're going to chuck it away. Well, but, but in the Martians as well. I mean, they're quite oh, difficult right. to if spot. If you see a lunar one, you're going to throw it in the bin. Wow. Whereas if you pick up a Martian one... You're keeping that bad boy, aren't you? Are you? Yeah, yeah. And this is why the data may be biased. <laughs> yes, because Ricky is single-handedly I destroying the lunar, lunar field. Yeah. I've thrown yeah. away. Yeah. 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 Um, but we should mention that this number will be going up, hopefully. Yes, uh, that's once right. Once Katie and Roma return from Indeed, their current yes. Antarctic Indeed. Ex- uh, expedition. Yeah. Indeed. Well. And do you know the Twitter if people want to follow that? It's uh, UK Antarctic Mets? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. I mean if you just google British Antarctic Mets. We can put it in the description um, box as well. Yeah. Oh, well, in fact, I think we're going to get a live yeah. um, <laughs> British Antarctic survey. In fact, no. <clears throat> as you listen this Christmas, they are out there on the That's ice. That's right, right now. They've got a, a slightly special meal to have because it's there. Yeah, look, there's the blog, uh, ukantarcticmeteorites.com, if you're there. Then, so, uh, yeah, they frequently update on they do. what's been yes. going on, yeah. so yeah. just hit it up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, in conclusion, there are loads of meteorites yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, our next question comes from Vicky, and Vicky asks... What do you think the general public's perception of scientists are? And what's one thing you wish uh, that they knew about being a scientist? And this is a good question. I think that there's a lot of... um, This makes me think about how science is reported in Mm. the media. And you very often get things that say... Young, handsome... Dr. Rick Dr. Rick over here. Well, I mean, apart from those specialist magazines, most of the newspapers, they'll go... (laughs) You know, uh, eggheads find this, boffin finds that. Sorry, eggheads. Yeah. <laughs> John? John? <laughs> 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 oh. 
<laughs> I, I find that very annoying. Like, it, it, there's like a it, it, the way they report it. Mm. It's like there's a divide between yeah, yeah, yeah. them and yeah, them and us, yeah. and it's like a it's like a lack of understanding. I think mm. of how knowledge exchange and knowledge ac- acquirement actually happens. Mm. I don't know if you feel the same. I don't know, but we, I read those articles and it just makes me annoyed. I because... agree, uh, and it definitely goes over into social interaction. So when I meet people and I tell them what I do, they're often like, "Whoa, you must be very, very clever." And I'm like, no, I'm just very good at one thing, as I assume you can do something that I can't do. Yeah, so, or you just go, oh, no, I'm just hardworking at this thing, yeah, yeah, but exactly. they must yeah. be hardworking in their exactly, field as well. Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, I think there's like a, yeah, we're all people. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, I think most people could do a PhD. I think yeah. if you have a 2-1 degree from yeah. a university, you, you're probably yeah. capable of doing a PhD. It mm. just requires that you know, commitment to say, okay, I'm going to dedicate X number of years to a particular topic. Well, just for, for instance, uh, recently I was I was at the gym lifting extremely heavy weight, <laughs> and a guy asked me, "Oh, can I can I work in on what you're doing?" And I said, "Yeah, do you want me to put the weight down?" He said, "Yes, obviously," uh, but he said he was a paramedic, and I was like, "That's amazing! That's such an incredible job!" And then he asked what I do, and he was like, "Oh, wow! I could never do that." And I said to him, "I could never do what you do." And he almost seemed like I was lying to him, which is not the case at all. It's just Mm. everyone has these amazing different sets of skills. And I feel like because of the media portrayal of what scientists are like, they if people feel like that we are above them in some way, which is not the case at all. Or some sort of bubble even. Yeah, yeah. I think another part of that is probably that when it comes to science, a lot of the things that are reported are the successes. And actually, you know, the months and months or years of of not quite making it are not encapsulated in the way that that's typically reported to people. And also, like, there's the... In a lot of media articles, the ambiguity is lost, isn't it? You know, you may have a paper that reports some findings and it's just a a suggestion or whatever and you also read a newspaper that says scientist finds this it's Mm. like well you know maybe maybe not exactly so for instance like uh, recent papers talking about scientists find evidence of life on Mars and it was to do with the methane cycling that occurs oh yeah I remember that and even the people who wrote those articles so wrote those journal articles will have said no no that's not what I was saying at all I wasn't saying there's definitely signs of life on Mars Uh, so it's just yeah the, the portrayal is just yeah um, anyway, it's a shame. Obviously, in the academic world, we're very careful with citing other yes. people's mm-hmm. work and, you know, avoiding plagiarism. And then it's a shame when the media takes that and, you know, things aren't cited properly, mm-hmm. yeah. sources aren't given for things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, that definitely builds up that barrier of yeah. us. And it's, a, it's a double-edged sword, though. So um, to call back to the episode I did on my subject, Mars, I was talking to my family about it afterwards and none of them are in academia. And my uncle, because I was trying to make what I do sound easy, sound mm, like yeah. so the public can understand it, he said, oh, it sounds like anyone could do what you do then. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, wow. I mean, that's a good thing, I guess, because that's what I wanted to come across as. <laughs> but... <laughs> is, is he now contesting you for your job? Yeah, well, no, he's applied for the position and he got it. So, <laughs> well, yeah. that's fair enough. Yeah. This will it? be the last episode that Ricky yeah. is on, sadly. Yeah. yeah. And welcome your uncle. (laughs) (laughs) He'll be on the next episode. Excellent. Can't get any worse. But that was a good question. That was nice to discuss that. No, I think it's a really, it's an important question too, I think. Um, But anyway, uh, our next question comes from Tasari. And she asks, how hot is the sun? Well, hot. Well, yeah, it's very hot. I mean, for comparison, you could literally fry an egg on the sun. Literally, you <laughs> could. It'd be overdone as soon as you die while trying to fry an egg. You could literally <laughs> vaporize yeah. an egg on yeah. the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's one of those philosophical questions. Is, yeah. <laughs> what came what vapor- first? The vaporized, the vaporized egg or you? <laughs> yeah. um, so, for comparison, the hottest place on the surface of Earth is Death Valley. Yeah. And that is around 41 degrees Celsius. And in fact, topical, you know, Australia have been reaching temperatures of 50 centigrade well, they, uh, recently, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then if we go to Venus for an, another extreme comparison, that's around 450 degrees Celsius on average. So the, I can't remember what the name of the lander was, the Soviet... Lunar, Venera. Venera. When that landed, uh, it started to melt as it landed. And yes, it did. It took like one picture, then yeah. melted, oh. didn't it? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So... On the surface of Venus, if you put a block of lead there, it would just melt. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to get your holiday snaps developed from boots, it probably might melt. It may. <laughs> yeah. May that's do. A re- that's a re- dated record. Yeah, that's a very <laughs> dated Who gets their photos developed yeah. anymore? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
What about the eggs? <laughs> no, the eggs. Well, um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of sulfur on Venus, so you might have a bit of a smelly egg. Uh. Answering the real questions. Will eggs cook on Venus? <laughs> and then, so as I said, Venus is about 450 degrees. So Death Valley around 41 or Australia recently reaching highs of 50 degrees Celsius. Venus 450, and then the sun, the surface of the sun, is around 10 times greater than that. It's around 5,000 degrees Celsius on average. But even our sun isn't really that hot for a star. Is it not? No, it's not. So there is a star in the... uh, Orion constellation, I believe. Uh, Is it Rigel? Rigel, yes. And that is over double the temperature of our sun. So that's around 11,000 degrees Celsius. Good Lord. And what type of sun is that? Big old blue one. <laughs> That's good. Well, thanks. Yeah. So here at the Cosmic Cast, we're not a massive fan of continuity. So our next question, in fact, comes from Colin Shaw. Thank you very much for your question, Colin. And he asks, what is the latest thinking on dark matter? And as we don't really know much about physics or dark matter or anything like that, we phoned a friendly physicist. Kat Hale, welcome back to the uh, podcast. Hello. You've apparently done a bit of research on, uh, on dark matter. Yes, so I did my master's research project working on a drift detector in, uh, buried in, in a mine in, uh, in North Yorkshire. Mm, cool. Mm. I didn't actually go at any point, but, you know, I stared at computer code for a lot of time. Yeah, well, that counts. <laughs> that counts. So what is dark matter? Um, so dark matter, uh, we don't know, um, essentially, still. Um, mm. It's something that we've known about since the 19, late 1970s. Um, we knew it was a problem from, like, you know, in inverted commas, um, from uh, 1980. Mm-hmm. Um, so we know that dark matter exists if, if this isn't something that you've really come across. We know that, it's, uh, that it exists because basically galaxies are spinning too fast. Right. So... We would expect that, given the the mass that we can see, the so stars and all of that kind of stuff, um, we we would expect galaxies to spin like in the middle, um, much faster than at the out at the outer edges, mm-hmm. um, because there's just more mass there. Mm-hmm. So the gravity means that it spins faster. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't happen. In fact, the light curves or the, the velocity curves of the stars that we see at the outside should, you know, we think they should be much lower, but they actually stay pretty much constant all the way out. Right. Um, and so that means that there must be mass out there that we can't see. That's so um, weird. So, yeah. So, I mean, there were a couple of um, other options. So there's sort of two ways of, of explaining it. Either there's more mass that we can't see, dark matter, or were there something wrong with the laws of gravity? Some fundamental force that's not being accounted for. Um, so yes, or that there's, or that there's, yeah, a problem with with the with the, with the mm. laws of gravity at such enormous distances mm. or something like that. Um, but with the recent gravitational waves research that's happened, that has just you know just come out in the last couple of years, we know now, like looking at the uh, the arrival times of those of those gravitational waves and the light that came with them, that. Uh, that essentially, essentially, those models, those models aren't right, and and our understanding of gravity is pretty much pretty much okay. So Einstein, even now, we haven't we haven't managed to break him yet. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if that's not the case, if gravity is right and it is it is working the way we think it's working, mm-hmm. then uh, then there must be something else there. And so there are sort of several several different options of what dark matter could be. Um, they kind of fall into three broad categories, hot, warm, and cold. Mm-hmm. Um, so hot is things like neutrinos. Um, however, although we have seen, so we know neutrinos exist, um, so they would be hot dark matter. Um, the problem is that they require the formation of the universe to have happened in a different way to the way we know it ha- did. Basically that superclusters of galaxies or some, some mass in like enormous quantities would have then broken up um, and formed galaxies. Um, however, we know that by looking at like the Hubble Deep Field and things like that, that uh, galaxies formed first and then sort of aggregated, built up into clusters and then superclusters. So they went the wrong way around. So we don't think it's that. Um, warm dark matter. Um, so this would, this is sort of uh, smaller things um, than hot dark matter, but, um, but they would have required the, um, well, um, so they have, uh, like, it leads to a different distribution of mass within galaxies. Um, some researchers think that this is actually a better fit for observations. Um, but uh, <laughs> the problem is that we, we haven't got a particle that's the right size 
even in theory. So we have no idea what could be dark matter if it is at that size. Um, so at the moment, it might be that that's a better option, but we haven't got any candidates for that. Um, and so that leaves um, cold dark matter. Um, it's the simplest of the options. Um, it's the, one, the easiest way to explain dark matter. Um, you know, Occam's razor says, you know, Simplest is usually the best. Um, so there are within this, there are several several candidates within cold dark matter. So that could be that it's actually made up of baryonic matter. So that's us, the stuff that makes up stars and humans and apples. Um, and um, but yeah, so that could be machos, which are like ma it stands for massive uh, compact halo objects. Does that come with cheese? No. <laughs> 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 yes, so massive rather than, well, yes, but um, so these are things like brown dwarfs, lonely planets, black holes, that kind of thing. But um, recent gravitation, or like micro lensing um, um, uh, surveys have found that essentially it just there, there aren't enough of them. There aren't enough of them. Um, another option would be primordial black holes. Um, so this became a big thing at one point where everybody thought, ah, oh, that's it. That's, that's the solution. Again, doing more lensing studies um, then essentially we do think there are quite a lot of these but they probably only produce maybe one percent mm -hmm. of the mass that we need um and we need to account for 25.9 percent of the mass so um yeah like the mass energy balance in the universe so that leaves us with something that we haven't seen yet so an exotic um candidate so that would either be wimps so weakly interacting massive particles or axions. Um, and so there are, are a, um, a hypothetical qu um, ele elementary particle. Um, so they were discovered in 1977, or proposed in 1977, as a way to solve a problem within quantum chromodynamics, which is just a big swanky word for like things that don't quite work in the standard model of particle physics. Um, so the idea is that after, in, after, so the inflation after the Big Bang would have meant that huge numbers of these axions were produced, because um, that's how we basically drive um, inflation. They have an incredibly low mass and so because they're so small there's nothing for them to break down into so they essentially can't go away but they're such small mass that we don't see them so they are a convenient explanation for um for uh, quantum uh, for like dark matter um however we've never seen them mm -hmm. um so at the moment there are searches underway at mit and the university of washington using um strong magnetic fields um, and we're, we're, so we're looking at, because um, uh, we currently don't have a way to probe uh, any particle in the mass range that mm. um, they would need to be in. So this is sort of a different way of doing it. And then the, the, the main candidate, I think one that most people are kind of most comfortable with, is uh, WIMPs. So yeah, weakly interacting massive particles. Um, so they interact with other particles. They, so they don't interact with the strong force or with electromagnetics, so we can't see them. Um, they interact through gravity. We think possibly the nuclear weak force um, and possibly another unknown force that isn't any stronger than the weak force, but also isn't zero. So um, some just magic, you know, essentially, you know, at this point it's magic. Um, <laughs> we can't explain it. So, uh, so one key suggestion is that um, with supersymmetric, or well, one of the supersymmetric extensions of the standard model of particle physics, um, there's just this perfect combination of things that we need uh, a wimp to be and the things that this this um, the extension would predict this particular particle and so it was sort of called the wimp miracle um, because mm. it was just like <laughs> these two things completely independently predicting a single like a single particle at the same like the same size um, so that was great, and everybody was very happy about this. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Large Hadron Collider didn't find anything there. Um, so the places that we thought it was going to be, we didn't see any hint of it from the Large Hadron Collider. Um, also, the LHC hasn't really seen any proof of supersymmetry at the moment. Um, and so it sort of casts some doubt on that particular candidate. Um, but yeah, so but there are other ways that we can do it, either direct or indirect observations. So um, there can be things like I did, so drift detectors, which are direct observations. So these are things where you see the impact of a wimp on a nucleus in a in a part in an experiment in a lab. Um, uh, so there are several ways of doing this. Some now are involving sort of super cooled germanium crystals, um, where they're basically trying to look essentially at the temperature increase. Of an, of, of an electron being excited in a, in a supercooled germanium crystal, which mm. is just 
like mind blowing. Um, you know, they're cooled down to like fifty million, uh, no, fifty micro Kelvin. Um, so they are like it's just yeah. mental. Um, oh no, 50, no, fifty milli, fifty milli Kelvin. But nonetheless, way. it's tight, like incredibly low temperatures. Yeah. And then, um, but then the other option is indirect observation. So this is places where we see huge concentrate or we expect large concentrations of, of dark matter, so centers of galaxies, things like that. Um, and we look at the decay products or look for the decay products. Um, so that's essentially where we're at. We still don't know, um, but we're still looking and we're looking in lots of different places. <laughs> well, it sounds like a fascinating field. Yes, yes, that I ran away from and decided to play with volcanoes <laughs> instead, but, you know. Well, that's fair enough, that's fair enough. Well, well that was very comprehensive. Kat, thank you very much for okay. uh, popping along, and uh, as if by magic, you will now tra- transform back into Ricky Bahir. Bye. <laughs> okay, so our final question comes from Mary, and Mary asks, how do you transport and store meteorites? If something goes wrong, does this impact what you can learn from a sample? A good question. Very good question. It's a very good question. So <clears throat> it's something that I know that Katie and the team have had to take mm. in a lot a lot of account for yeah. uh, because almost as important as the way you transport the meteorite is how you collect it. Yeah. And how you collect it and then transport it depends on where you collect it. It's also a function of what questions you want to answer from the meteorite. Absolutely, yeah. And and what type of meteorite it is as well, because not all meteorites can answer all of the questions. Mm. So mm. No, you they know, can't I'm... talk for starters. Hmm? <laughs> That's a fantastic Terrible. joke, John. Um, so some meteorites, you might be interested in the paleomagnetic signature of magnetic minerals yep. within the meteorite. Yeah. If you want to do that, you have to be really careful that you don't put any magnets anywhere near them mm-hmm. because that can overprint that signature and then you, you just won't re- receive anything useful from what will a- end up being quite an expensive set of measurements. Mm, which so, is tricky because aren't magnets used sometimes to find the meteorites out in the field? Well, it depends. Yeah, in, in s- some ways, yes. But when, when they're doing kind of the proper meteorite hunting on, on strewn fields in Antarctica, for instance, it's pretty much all visual okay um with you know the the aim that you're seeing black rocks pretty much on a white surface i know that when you're doing um desert field searches that that's different obviously because what you're looking for looks a lot more like the background but they have tools uh su- such as I, sp- I think roma spoke about before the amet met yeah um which is a combined magnetic susceptibility yeah. electrical conductivity probe that picks up not just uh, a magnetic signature from a rock, but also whether or not electricity is conducting through it. So basically whether or not there's any metal in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and on the topic of metal, obviously weathering is is an mm-hmm. important part of what happens, especially to the, the outside of the rock, but also can penetrate, I think, to a certain degree into the rock if it's mm. fractured, yeah. cracked, that sort of thing. So you will not... You don't want it to go rusty over time, basically. Exactly, and yeah. so th- this is this is sort of something that's already happened in the case of uh, something that you might find in a desert, unless you are very lucky and, yeah. like I know they do in Australia, yeah. go and collect um, observed falls. But when it comes to Antarctic rocks, you have to keep them cold until you can defrost them in a controlled environment yeah. where that water isn't just left sitting on the sample, because that obviously <clears throat> would cause... Uh, you know, w- weathering weathering of the sample. And mm-hmm. that, that would also have an impact on what you could measure on the sample surface, to, yeah. you know, depending on what you were looking for. Yeah. And then another thing that you have to consider is um, biological material. Mm. Because if you don't collect it very cleanly, store it in a sterile environment, mm. and then look at it without exposing it to, you know, people touching it or, um, you know, the exhaust from a car or something, mm. any of that foreign material... Would would completely obscure any kind of actual real biological material in your sample. Yeah. So, and we can put a link into the podcast where we were talking a bit more about this, weren't we? And uh, yes. when they were looking at potential biological mm-hmm. activity in. Um... So, just for clarification, I should stop storing all the meteorites in a bag of worms, then, or is that? Um, I, think I mean, it depends it's good for the what worms. meteorites. If it's just um, like a one from the desert. You're probably fine. It's not a lunar one, let's be honest. I mean, if it's a lunar one, you can I'd store it in a bag of worms. But, but again, out. right, it depends on what you want to answer. If you want to do look at some general chemistry, then you can stick it in a bag of worms. You're yeah. not really going to compromise its trace element signature. 
The meteorite eating worms, by the way. Uh, right, well, right. in which case, uh, I mean, you'd be better off selling it on eBay. The worms or the meteorite. I'm Both. just trying to clarify. I'm just trying to, for the listeners out there, I'm just trying to get a clear picture. Okay. Uh, the worms. So I'm assuming when they move them from Antarctica, though, to wherever they want to look at them, they don't store in a bag of worms like I do. No, they no. store it in ice, don't they? I think. Well, I think they're, they're typically kept in... As, as little ice as possible yeah. where, where they're picked mm-hmm. up, but they're kept in a refrigerated environment until they can... So that's just to prevent the, the water that's potentially there from melting? Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And there might be someone out there who's interested in analysing that localised ice or whatever. I mean, you never yeah. know what people want to do. Exactly, yeah. That's the yeah. Thing. So it's always yeah. best to be you know as clean as possible mm. just in case someone out there wants to do something relatively obscure yeah. and then they can't. And uh, you never know. It's, it's better to be clean at the start yeah. and then find that you can do the analysis you didn't know you wanted to do than to want to do something special and then find that you can't later down the line. Yeah, so Absolutely. I wonder if that's an issue when it comes to looking at meteorites of knowing what order to do your analyses in because you never know what people want to look at when they're... Definitely, that's why you've got to plan for any contingency. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why that, they a spent a long time thinking about you yeah. know what is you know they're the cleanest yeah. procedure they can do. And it? that's one of the reasons that some of the work that I've been doing, trying to use um, photogrammetry to look at the outside of samples, um, is 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 ideal because it allows you to produce a model of the sample which would you know let you mm. look at the volume, the density of the sample, which is kind of useful in preliminary mm. classification activities. Um, but it doesn't subject the sample surface to anything that's not light. Mm. Uh, you can do similar things with CT or, or computer tomography studies or, or laser scanning. Um, but but this way, you do absolutely nothing to the sample, which means that you've got a model that you can blow up, have a look at, um, decide how you want to cut it, mm. all of that sort of thing. But mm. the procedure that you approach how you analyze your sample with is, is definitely mm. very important, and a lot of mm. thought goes into that. Yeah, absolutely. So, Ooh. yeah, something that we need to think about a lot for, for sample return missions. Oh, yeah, future. yeah, as well, absolutely. Um, I and mean, that's going to be even more uh, clean and sterile, particularly exactly. for Mars. I mean, yes, who well, knows what is lingering around. Yeah. In fact, you may even be worms on Mars. I mean, <laughs> who knows? Well, all the asteroid Maybe. samples that are uh, yeah. hopefully going yeah, to Yeah, and all the amino acids and all that kind yeah. of stuff, yeah. Mm, definitely yeah. yeah. exciting no, it's good. times yeah. for us all. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, that's uh, all the questions that we have, actually. Thank you all uh, t- to everyone who submitted a question. Mm, Thank you yes. very much. That was uh, a good haul. Um, and, you know, if you've got any questions in the intervening time, again, just, you know, message us or comment on our um, videos mm-hmm. and, you know, we'll do another Q&A yeah. in a few months' time, probably. I imagine around Easter time, maybe. Who knows? We'll store them up. Yeah, if you send a good Yeah, we'll question, store them up we'll and then we'll, them uh, yeah. we'll bank them for later. Yeah. yeah. And if you are watching this on the YouTube, yes, I uh, hope this was okay. Format, so we hope oh, well, that's, okay, yeah. that camera is dead now, so okay. we're on this camera for here for the for the rest I'm of over it. Here hiding, um, assuming, let, it's still going. Yeah, assuming it's still going. it's still going. So let us know if you've enjoyed watching yeah. us. Yeah, because uh, we are unsure of how we're going to progress. We don't know whether we might start doing video. We'll yeah. see what your response is like. Let yeah. us know. Let us know. Uh, also, if you're not watching it, thanks for listening on Spotify. Absolutely, yes. Uh, and if you're what, listening on Spotify, watch us on YouTube. YouTube as well. Yeah. <laughs> Give us both of those. Yeah. yeah um, it really helps the viewer counts. It does, yeah. And thank you very much for listening. And thanks for the questions again. Indeed. And we hope you have a great holiday. Indeed. And happy new year. Yeah. And we'll be back. Oh, we're going to take a short break, actually. We'll, we'll be back. For regular episodes towards the end of January, uh, we've got a few conferences that we'll all be away at. Um, so expect a few vlogs in the meantime from us. Yep. Um, but until then, thank you very much and have a happy new year. Bye.